All right, y'all, welcome back. We are here for another Awaken the Psalmist episode. And uh, this one, is, this episode that we're going to talk about is really near and dear to my heart. I spoke about it a little bit in our last episode, but we're going to really get down to the nitty gritty about it. All right. This is worship leader versus psalmist. All right. That's like one of the biggest questions that so many people have. Uh, I have seen so many psalmists trapped in the little body, not the little body, but in the body of a worship leader. And a lot of them are walking around very confused, very frustrated, very limited, and very compressed. Okay, if I can use that word, very compressed. And I understand that um, a lot of it is just a lack of knowledge. And so my job today is to kind of break down what this really means and what it really is for us. First of all, let me tell you to all of the psalmists out there, I know how you feel. All right. I know how you feel. Here's why. What many people don't understand is that the revelation, the key and the tool of a psalmist is unlocked through the intimacy of worship. So there is no way that we can just get up and do our job without uh, making sure that the atmosphere is potent and conducive for the impartation. It's kind of like gardening for a moment. Like you got to have the right temperature to be able to plant the right seed to get the right fruit or uh, end result out of what you're trying to plant or impart into the body of people. In our case, it's always transformation, but we always want them to hear the heart of God. But if the atmosphere is not conducive for it, then we have to plow through praise and through worship, right, to make sure that the atmosphere is pliable. Don't want to use the word? Yes, pliable for imparting and planting the seed of transformation that God wants to release through his people. But we struggle there because we never get past praise and worship. <laughs> like praise and worship is already 15 minutes in our churches, most of them. Or if you have gotten on the progressive train, your praise and worship could be 45 minutes to an hour now and people get stuck just in the presence of the Lord, but we're still tilling through the ground that makes it pliable for what God wants to impart. I can honestly say that the grace of a psalmist does not, uh, and the revelation that they are called to carry is truly unlocked through encounters. And of course, the only way in is by way of worship. It's like praise and worship is the key to the door that unlocks this whole new world for people to be able to experience that. Uh, so you may have a lot of psalmists where their training ground for encounters is through praise and worship. But again, we got to bust through that box and ensure that they don't become generalized as a worship leader. Like there are a lot of people... Um, since we released Refresh Worship 1, you have seen an emergence of those that are psalmists or even worship leaders that are now archiving their flows, they're archiving their encounters and their experiences. And people are now starting to question the difference between what a psalmist do and what a worship leader do, because everybody thinks that it's all about a flow. Well, that's a real serious misconception when you think that it's all about a flow. We're not just flowing to show how creative we are. We're not just flowing for the sake of uh, spontaneity. We're flowing right to go somewhere. Wherever a river flows, it's flowing to a particular destination. And that destination could be a big ocean body of water. It could lead us to a city. It could lead us to so many different things. And the question comes in is when we have worship leaders that are just learning how to flow off of spontaneity, where are they taking us? Generally, the psalmists have a destination. And that destination will be the heart and the goal of God for that encounter or for that moment. And every time we gather together, the congregation should be ready to go to a different place. I remember training I was in a very intense season of training um, at my parents' church, and God would use the platform of praise and worship to develop something in me to be able to navigate through, guard, and cultivate atmospheres. So my key focus became the atmosphere that was conducive with the goal that God wanted to release 
in a moment and in a day. So say, for example, we're walking in a service, we're getting ready to get started and we ask God to deliver his people. And that's God's goal. God's goal is to deliver and set the people free. But they come in hardened. They come in challenged. We had this experience before and they come in broken. My brother Nick talks about this all the time where, you know, he literally came in from a service. We were already in the middle of a worship set and the Lord like literally flipped the script and was coming after his people so hard and hit my brother. He was just sitting there. He, he, he made it up in his mind. I am not going to budge. You are not going to move me. I am not going to do anything. Can I tell y'all that the Lord halted that entire service because of his rebellion? <laughs> the Lord. And we laugh and joke about it now because he was just so on it about not being moved. He was like, I shall not be moved. You're not going to move me. You're not going to do anything of this nature. I had no idea, but the Lord literally, he set the goal and said, Hey, I need that this ground to be broken so that I can impart something new. And so that he wouldn't leave not one person out. So as a psalmist and not just a worship leader, but as a psalmist in that moment, I had to carry the responsibility of not just leading people to the throne of God and to the presence of God, but allowing them to get the goal that God wanted them to be at in that day or during that encounter or in that moment. And so my job or my work was bigger than just singing a song to get you prepared for the word. That's what a lot of worship leaders, they, their main goal is my only job is to get you prepared for the word of God. Well, we're supposed to bring you into an encounter to see God, to encounter God, to have face to face encounters with the Lord. Now, will it come by way of word? Yes. Will it come by way of movements and different things, different activities that we engage in in the church? Absolutely. But my job is to ensure that the atmosphere is set and that it is conducive for what God wants to do. So he's very stubborn. And I think we plow a whole nother hour in worship. And while we're in worship, there are keys that are being distributed and given to different people for different types of encounters in the same room. A psalmist carried the capacity to be able to not only navigate through those encounters, but to be able to shamar those encounters to ensure that every single person has their own individualized encounter with the Lord and collectively as a whole, the water levels, as we say, or the spirit of the Lord remains high enough so everyone can continue to have this transformational experience in the presence of the Lord. I'm telling you, this is not just about you selecting songs to get people primed and ready. It's about setting an atmosphere and an encounter uh, that is conducive for the goal and the heart of God. Every time you come together, every time a psalmist is in the room, God wants to release something amazing. He wants to release something magnificent, something different. This is not only just to, uh, this is not to eliminate all of the other gifts and graces that are present that help collaborate to bring about this type of encounter. But we're just specifically talking about the psalmist here and how the psalmist just cannot be boxed into uh, just this box of being a worship leader. Uh, you can lead people to worship, but you also have to be able to navigate them through encounters. And that's what the psalmist is equipped for, through the intimacy of worship. So what does that mean also too for the psalmist? You're going to have to have a very strong uh, intimacy connection with the Lord. It's going to be very, very key that you don't just get up and sing what you think the congregation needs to hear. It's going to be very important that you have such a level of communion and connection and fellowship with the Lord that you are able to be of one heart and of one mind with him. It's going to be so important that your time of fellowship with the Lord is uh, heavily invested in so that when you come into a place, you don't become a chameleon, right? You don't hide in the congregation or in the culture of an atmosphere that you become so familiar with what's in the room that you can't break through. You have to be able to stand out through your intimacy with the Lord. And so although worship is extremely pivotal to the grace of a psalmist, it is not the box in which we place them in. My question to you today is, are you called to just lead people 
to the presence of the Lord? Or are you called to navigate them through the encounters that really impart the heart of God for where they're getting ready to go? That's for a congregation. That could be for individuals. That could be for a region. It could be for a state, a nation, whatever field God has called you into. You got to recognize that your voice and through the intimacy that you have with Jesus Christ through worship, that your voice God will use to literally navigate people to the next place. We are flowing to go somewhere. We are flowing to get to a particular place that God is calling us into. And you are called to bring that out of the people and to allow them to experience God and help them navigate through those moments. So I hope you know today that you are not just one who leads people into just worship and times of worship with the Lord. You're not just one who show people how to worship, but you help show them how to navigate the intimate, I mean, most intimate moments of fellowship with Jesus Christ. And it's going to be life changing and it will change the lives of every person that you come in contact with every moment every single day, every single encounter at a time. No. If you have... Now, if you're talking about two separate people or you're talking about the different seasons in one individual, because I can honestly say my season as a worship leader... I did not have this much depth than I did as a psalmist. I recognize the responsibility as a psalmist to echo the heart of God, different than a preacher, different than a prophet, right? But it was more so about being uh, able to know when to plant, when to water, when to pluck up. You know, it's like being a gardener almost and knowing uh, which is why I think that it's so key. If David is our example of a psalmist, looking at him as the shepherd, knowing the time to feed the sheep, knowing the time to clean the sheep, knowing the time to, you know, uh, administer healing when they were when they were needed, I think that is pivotal in it. And I think him being a shepherd was not only training for him as a king, but it was training for him to carry the heart of God. David was considered and defined as a, as a man after God's own heart. And so the psalmist carries that same burden. So it doesn't matter what place I'm in. I just have to be so connected to God that he is able to use me as he will to voice whatever he needs to be voiced. That could be a warning in a moment. But a worship leader may only be concerned about leading people to the presence of the Lord, but what they do after that they may not know. The walls. Oh Lord. That's a that's a really good thing to like actually explore. The walls of a psalm is like teaching worship leaders. It's so crazy. My heart has been broken just off of the lack of investment that worship leaders have concerning where the people want to go or where God needs the people to go. They are so concerned, worship leaders, I'm sorry, but it seemed like we're very concerned about the people being so hyped for the word of the Lord that the preached man is going, the preached woman is going to release that we never actually tap into God's heart for the people. We only tap into what the people want to get them ready for the word, not I'm responsible to also to play a role in carrying God's heart for them as well, which means that sometimes a worship leader lack the burden of intercession. They lack the burden of, and, and when I talk about intercession, it's like, all right, if intercession is me inter, uh, mediating between two opposing parties and I'm standing there and I'm saying the party is their will versus the will of God. And as a psalmist, my job is to echo the will of God. Then I have to figure out how do I intercede for a person, you know, who, who has an opposing will. And so a lot of times worship leaders are 
um, some of them are very, very, especially the pure ones, when they know there is more in God, they only think that it's more in God from an encounter perspective, from an experience perspective. But what is the more? And they kind of sometimes lack the language for the more because they're like, I'm only supposed to lead you to a place. And the psalmist is like, I'm going to lead you and I'm going to give language for this place. And that's really the difference. So sometimes I can see that the worship leader may sometimes lack investment in the people, investment in God's heart for the people. And to me, that is the biggest woe. I mean, whoa. And it's really hard to plow, turn the heart over for that, which is why I know there is a distinct difference because your heart, you got to have a heart for that. You got to kind of be born with a heart for that. Like nobody knows David's beginning of being a shepherd, but we know he had a heart for the sheep. We know that he had a heart for God's heart, but we never really know his beginning. We just know that he was bold enough to stand up for it. There had to be some level of investment in an intimate space that allowed him to get to that point where he could stand up to a giant as little as he was and say, who dares defile <laughs> the, the living God? Who dares stand up against the one who is mighty and king? So, you know, what? how he responded speaks to a level of investment that he had in the presence of the Lord, and in the sheep enough that he will fight lions. What did, what did it, lions and tigers and bears? That was Jasmine Sullivan. But, <laughs> you know, it had to be like some level of investment that you would go up against a beast for a sheep. Say la. Because <laughs> that's the difference. The psalmist will go up against the beast for a sheep. I will administer deliverance through song up against a beast, a principality, all your generational demons for the sheep. You know, um, one of the first things I said about this particular project of Awaken the Psalmist was that the people just needed to know. They need to know what it's like to be in this grace, in, in this lane. That, and when I say the people, I'm not talking about the congregation. Because the congregation gonna follow the leader. I'm more so talking about the pastors, the leaders. Like, if the pastors in, first of all, if that music critic that I experienced back in 2017 said, hey, we haven't seen psalmist since the day of David. If he thought that the psalmist was extinct, guess what? Our leaders are operating like the psalmist, that lane and that grace for them is extinct. And they don't really know. And I think it's important to do things like this, to really bring about an unveiling to the importance of a lane that is ancient, still relevant for this day that God is calling to be reemerged. We've seen a silence of the psalmist. And I think that if we, I would say to the worship leader um, to, to be still and to know that he is God and like God is in control and he is still doing some amazing things. But I know the frustrations that have come with a lot of worship leaders that say, my pastor doesn't understand. Or I'd rather just be quiet in the pew than to even sing on a worship team because the worship leader doesn't accept or embrace me or I'm not giving room or space to echo it. Or there may be uh, some type of um, jealousy or envy that arises within the church because the your vocal assignment is different. I would say to you that God is literally shaking the ground and he is pulling back the covers so that we all will know that there is, that God is sending out voices specifically for such a time as this to be those that will echo his heart uniquely, uh, be those that will, again, navigate through encounters. And this is something I've shared in the previous episodes 
already. And so I think it's important that that we continue to have these discussions. We continue to educate um, that the leaders will have an ear to hear what the Lord is doing in this hour, not just in finances, not just in church growth, but also with the voice so that we will be able to put the psalmist in their rightful position and they won't die in your church. <laughs>